Welcome to a beautiful beginning, a modern Miss Mason workshop. My name is Leah Bowden and tonight I am really looking forward to taking you back to my beginnings with my children with a Charlotte Mason education and hopefully taking your hand and leading you along a little bit into how you can build the beautiful foundations of a Charlotte Mason education. Um, we have various kind of um, sections to our evening together. I'm saying evening, I know some of you're watching on the replay and it's probably first thing in the morning or middle of the day but as we are recording it is eight o'clock at night here on a Saturday evening in England um, we have got various sections to our evening together um, I'm going to be talking about preparation expectation realization and formation and then we will be having a q a now the questions and answers uh, what would be really helpful if you look at the bottom of your um, screen there should be a chat section if you're on your phone you might have to click on where it says more um, but as i am talking throughout our time together please put the questions into the chat box and our lovely christine will be keeping an eye on those if, I, if there are tons of questions, you might find that all the things that are in your head get answered throughout the evening. But even if there's a question early on, pop it in there and then you might suddenly feel actually that's been answered. But please do chat in the chat box. I will try not to look at it, even though it does come up in front of me. I will try to not look at it. But if you do have a question, please, we'd love to hear them. There are no silly questions. Just get them all in there. And uh, we're all in this together. And I'd love to try and um, yeah, answer as many as possible. So as I said, our time um, in this workshop is broken down into four sections and we're going to be, it's, I'll just go through those four things again, preparation, expectation, realization and formation. I'm going to be breaking down this idea of how you can really lay a beautiful foundation for the beginnings of a Charlotte Mason education for children under six years old. Now, I was particularly excited about this workshop. I've actually never done a workshop before talking about the preschool years, but actually uh, it was that it's such an incredible time and it's such a time when everything is fresh and new. And I just remember fondly those amazing years of feeling so enthusiastic, but so desperate to learn and also exhausted most of the time. So I do remember it. Um, and it was incredible. And that's why I always call it a beautiful beginning, because this is the time of putting things in place for yourself as a mother. And we may have some dads on sometimes we get some dads on as well but putting those things in place to be able to build upon and the stronger your foundations the better the structure that you build so I know I hope that you leave this session feeling that you are beginning to put some of those things in place um, our children are learning every day all day you guys know you're watching your three-year-olds your four-year-olds maybe you're here with a baby I had someone message me today said I've got a 10 month old and I'm already thinking about these things and they are constantly making sense of the world around them and you don't have to do much, do you? You can watch them engaging with the world, soaking everything up. Even as newborn babies, they are watching and observing what is going on around them. Charlotte Mason's first principle is that children are born persons. They are whole and ready to begin engaging with the world. And that belief is a very much part of the beginning of where we start with the Charlotte Mason philosophy. Well, before we jump in any further about our children, our home, the philosophy, and I'm gonna get you doing a little bit of study with me this evening as well. I want to start this session by talking about you. You, tired, hardworking mama. <laughs> I know that um, if you are uh, maybe some, and you can let us know in the chat, maybe you are, have got one child, it's your first uh, young child. Maybe you have lots of children and you are starting the Charlotte Mason philosophy or you're starting home educating with your young children. Um, maybe you want to just uh, let us know in the chat while I get going here, how many children you've got or how old they are, just go for it and find each other on, on here. Um, but I want to start with you. 
I want to start with the importance of laying the foundations in the parents. And I'm going to use the term mother a lot because that's I am a mother. But I do know lots of dads that uh, watch these workshops as well, often because I bring Dave along, but he's not here tonight. Um, and uh, they and I know they watch on the replay as well. So hi to all the dads. Um, this is great. We've got people putting their kids' ages in um, in the chat here. So you... I want to start with you. Now, um, one of my earlier workshops, I did talk about, and I do talk about this a lot, how Charlotte Mason encouraged the mother teacher to stay intellectually alive, uh, keep learning, keep reading. She also encouraged us to go out to play. And uh, maybe later on, I can link you to that replay where you can um, uh, dive more into the idea of how you can keep learning and what Charlotte Mason said about the mother. But this is what she said about the theory of education. So this is in, um, as you know, men, most of you will know Charlotte Mason was a vicarious writer. She wrote and wrote and wrote. She wrote poetry. She wrote geography books. She wrote um, articles and she wrote six volumes. In fact, it was more than six, but they were kind of put into six for us of educational books about educational theory. And she, at the very beginning of the first book, which is really pitched at younger children, um, par for, for parents with younger children, she says this, she, speaking about us, she should have something more than a hearsay acquaintance with the theory of education. So she should have something more than a hearsay acquaintance with the theory of education. Now, how I interpret that hearsay nowadays in the world we live in is very much, you know, she should have something more than a social media acquaintance with the theory of education or a blog acquaintance with the theory of education. We can very easily pick up our what we think is um, an educational theory from the squares that we scroll every day. I know when I started homeschooling many moons ago, we didn't have social media. I know, I can still kind of see the gray hair coming, but we didn't have it. And I, I was reading blogs and I could have easily picked up what I thought I knew from blogs. Now, I'm not saying they're not helpful. I'm not saying don't listen to anyone else. Why would you be here tonight? We're here to encourage each other and learn from each other's journeys. But don't just have hearsay. Don't just have other people's ideas and other people's theory, other people's take on this philosophy. We must make it our mission to gain our own knowledge of educational theory. Now, you might be saying, but Leah, I am breastfeeding. I have a toddler. I have, um, you know, a, a four year old. I don't know how to have time to do this. OK, I'm just going to give you all a few little tips on how to engage with the Charlotte Mason's work. So my first thing is read volume one. I'm, I'm reaching back because um, I have one of the, yes. So um, I have a few different versions of home education. So home education is Charlotte Mason's first volume of work. Now, some of you may be on here and you've already read it. This particular version, I think, is Living Books Press. Um, there are so many available now. It's wonderful. So you can read it in book form whilst you're feeding a baby or they're all asleep or it's nap time. But there are many other ways you can engage with this. Um, on Ambleside Online, they have... Um, the whole of the books um, online for you to read. They also have them in modern English and you can buy the printed version of that on Amazon or various other places as well. So you can read them in modern English. There are podcasts that people have recorded reading the book. If you know what LibriVox is, LibriVox is a whole host of books that have free in the public domain and people record books and put them on there you can listen to home education um, on free on librivox so there are um, i mean that's just a few ways you can engage with becoming acquainted with educational theory so if you don't get that reading time and i remember 
I remember there being the the dark years of not reading as much as I as I really wanted to. But now, I mean, I love audiobooks and LibriVox and all that kind of stuff. So the LibriVox recording of home education is very good. The only thing that might stumble that kind of makes it stick uh, between chapters is, is that they have to do this little spiel about LibriVox. But you know what? Once you get over that, you can actually be a busy mum cooking dinner, having one AirPod in maybe and listening to um, LibriVox. So just a little tip there on how to engage. I definitely recommend for everybody doing this workshop, if you haven't yet, start, start home education. This book was particularly written for parents um, of children under nine years of age. So it's very much preparing you and your children for those beginning years. So how else can you uh, prepare yourself? The second thing I would say, as well as engaging with the book, is to find community. And I know I get lots of messages um, from people who are struggling to do that. Like I haven't found my people and you might start online finding people that you connect with well, and then you might meet in real life, but there's something about those early years when you find community, you find one or two kindred spirits, you find somebody else who is on that same journey and feels passionate about the same things. You might be completely different on loads of other things, but if you somehow can find community in those early years, I honestly can tell you that they build strong and beautifully for the future. If you can, and even if it's just one other family and you know, you can have those conversations. So I had, a, I had a friend who I met very early on in my homeschool years who, um, we just used to chat about Charlotte Mason whenever we got together and I'm still friends with her today and we still talk all things books and Charlotte Mason and our children are getting older and older and older and that has been really precious to me. So engage with educational theory as much as you can, however uh, you can do that. Try and find community try and find a kindred spirit. And like I said, you often can do this by, you know, if you're on a workshop like this, just pop into the chat. Hey, anybody in my city, find your people. You can do it on Instagram. You can do it on Facebook. There are, there are groups everywhere. I know here in the UK, we do it. We've got a big UK community. We've got Birmingham. Is that Birmingham, UK? <laughs> um, we have people from all over who find each other then online and then we have we host picnics and retreats and it's great we've got loads of people from the UK on tonight I love this and so then finding each other just just that one person you can have that conversation uh, so I was with a group recently and there was a lady who hadn't she was quite new to this idea of having these conversations with kindred spirits and she said Oh, it's so amazing to be around people who are talk like that, that, you know, that you have the same thoughts and you converse in the same way and you engage. There's somebody from the Ukraine. Sorry, I'm, you're catching my eye with where, where you're all from, New England. Um, and she said, this is amazing. And we were on this trip and we were finding um, nature and everybody was identifying things and all the kids were gathering around this thing that we'd identified. And there was something of this kindred spirit. There was something of finding each other um, that really meant so much to her. And I know that you will find that too. And I'm sorry if that's hard. I'm sorry if you live somewhere where you haven't found um, other people in your area, but make it a mission to find community and um however you can do that find it and for some people they do create an online book uh, book club or something like that where even if they can't be near each other they can get a couple of people online to read maybe um uh, home education together and just have those beautiful heartfelt conversations with people who are on the same wavelength as you it's amazing so get uh, how can you prepare so get yourself immersed in educational theory read wide but if nothing else try and work your way through home education read it slowly and in a moment I'm going to show you how to do that and how to really engage with the text and connect with the text. Find community that will bring everything to life for you. Um, the other thing is to actually um, 
you know, talk, find, find the books that you can read together. So do a book club or read books that um, will help you engage with the Charlotte Mason philosophy whilst you're reading her work. Now, when I first started homeschooling, um, the, the, pink volumes were the ones that were most easily available but they were quite pricey for my budget I remember putting them on my Christmas list but these are the first few books that I read that were really helpful now just to throw it in there most of you will know that I am currently writing a book for you all but it doesn't come out until January 2023 put it in your diary to, to get it then uh, hopefully you'll be able to pre-order it by next summer but that will be coming very soon and you have to know that that you mums who are on here tonight with children six and under you were really on my heart and really on my mind as I was writing this any you're, when you're a writer you're and when you're writing a book and working on a project you're told a great thing to do is to have somebody in mind, you know, to have like an avatar of this is who I'm writing for. And basically she looked like you. She was you. You're the one who is eager to learn, uh, just this uh, enthusiastic about keeping that wonder in childhood and wanting to be you know, loving this stage, but wanting to grow and learn as well. So I will keep you posted, but that will be coming your way. But these were some of the books that really helped me in my younger years. So there I was pregnant. I had a toddler. I had, and I think I was schooling two children. And this is one of the books. It is, um, Karen Angiola is um, a Christian and this is very much for the faith community. It's very much uh, that's uh, the whole book is, is like that but she she kind of breaks down so it's the Charlotte Mason companion it's pretty old now as you can see it's peeling I've, I've flicked through this so many times but I found this really really helpful because she kind of puts um she kind of puts legs on some of the stuff that I was trying to get to grips with often we read the theory and we kind of go yeah but how does that look how does that look day to day? And, and Karen really does that. Um, it's quite a hefty book. I don't even know. I'm sure it's slim print. Um, but that was one of the things that I read alongside reading the Charlotte Mason books as well. Another person who was really helpful for me in my younger years was Catherine Leveson. Again, I don't really know much about her anymore, uh, but she, as in, you know, what she's doing, if she's still writing, there's a couple of books and they, again, really, really practical on how does it look? I don't know about you, but that's really what I wanted to know. Like when it comes to, you know, handwriting and science and I mean, my book's falling apart here. You can see um, music appreciation and she literally just goes there's two pages that explain in detail this is what it looks like breaking down all the suggested subjects within the Charlotte Mason education she has one for the younger years and then she has one for the older years as well so I think she might have more than that but just as an example you know and do you know what now you guys have this rich resource of um, things available for you to read and engage with. Um, if I could show you my bookshelves of books I've been reading and researching um, whilst writing, I think I've got every book written about Charlotte Mason as well as her books. And there are so many wonderful ones. I do want to recommend um, a local girl to you, actually. Um, some of you may have heard of her. Amy Fisher. So she is American, but she lives in England. She's part of the community here in the UK. And she has got children who are six and under. I think, I think her eldest may be six now. Um, and she has pulled together this self-published this book called Before Curriculum. And um, so how to start practicing the Charlotte Mason philosophy in your home. And you can get that as an ebook and or you can buy it like I did and I, I want to recommend that to you because she's done a fantastic job um it's really beautifully put together it's it's um it's thin you know easy to read but again she is thinking about the mums with younger children so there's a few that you can get hold of and you can be reading alongside listening on LibriVox to home education so there are so many ways aren't there that we can actually prepare ourselves but I want to encourage you before you start it's so easy 
to start wanting to prepare the space and put posters on the walls and organize trips and join groups and buy books. But actually that we just need to pause and remember that the greatest resource in your child's education right now is you. It's you because you are the one who is loving and nurturing and reading with them and showing them the world. So please take a moment, please take some time before you enthusiastically rush into everything else that I'm going to say to think about how you can strengthen your journey, what you can be reading, who you can be connecting with and how you can continuously grow as a teacher as a learner as a mother um as i've said we'll we'll we'll, we'll put some um links to how you can get hold of some past workshops and other things that I've done but I do a whole session on uh, the mother and how you can stay intellectually alive and continue to um just to play and enjoy enjoy life so preparation then how you can prepare for a charlotte mason education and stay alive stay growing charlotte mason said the sole end of education is growth and i believe that very much for the mother for the parents just as much as i do for the children Okay, so let's jump into our next section. So we've done preparation. We're now going to look at expectation. What did Charlotte say? What did Charlotte Mason say? I'm just going to share a couple of uh, parts from volume one tonight, but I actually want to get you to engage with the text. I want you to read it slowly with me and to look at how you could see into this and discern for yourself what she is saying to the mother of young children. So I'm just going to pull up on my screen. Okay. Just going to minimize all you lot. There we go. Okay, so here we have a quote from um this from volume one so we're just going to read it slowly together i'm going to read it aloud and then i'm going to give you a moment to read it slowly again yourself and just to think about maybe if you've got a notebook you could write down all the words that really stand out to you my object is to show that the chief function of the child his business in the world during the first six or seven years of his life is to find out all he can about whatever comes under his notice by means of his five senses, that he has an insatiable appetite for knowledge got in this way and that therefore the endeavour of his parents should be to put him in the way of making acquaintance freely with nature and natural objects that in fact the intellectual education of the young child should lie in the free exercise of perceptive power because the first stages of mental effort are marked by the extreme activity of this power and the wisdom of the educator is to follow the lead of nature in the evolution of the complete human being so I'm just going to pause for a moment now I'm actually going to um, uh, yeah, just, I was going to say, I was going to mute. Yes, I'm going to mute my microphone. And I want you just to read it again, really slowly. And if you've got a bit of paper near you, just to write down, or maybe if you've got um, the the book by you, maybe you've got volume one by you. It's You can see there, it's page 66 to 67. And you could do some underlining if you wanted. But just take a moment to read slowly and see what stands out to you. If you want, you can put some of those words into the chat. Feel free to 
to do that? Some of the phrases or words that really stand out to you? Okay, we're going to come back to that one in a moment. And the next one is a little bit shorter. So next one we're going to look at. Okay, so this is some of you will have will have read this one before. This is quite um, a well-known one. In this time of extraordinary pressure, educational and social, perhaps a mother's first duty to her children is to secure for them a quiet growing time, a full six years of passive receptive life, the waking part of it spent for the most part out in the fresh air. So again, just take a moment. This is a little bit shorter. Just read through it. Visually underline as something or write it down, pop it in the chat, put it in your notes. Just give you a moment to do that. Okay, so we're going to go back to the first one and I'm going to show you my underlining. So this is what jumped out. This is what jumps out to me. Um, maybe it was similar for you. So the chief function of the child, his business in the world. And this to me really is so countercultural to the traditional education uh, educational kind of theories or the traditional practices of education that especially we know here in the UK is that we would be maybe talking about attainment and standardization and what should be the outcome and here even as a young child and here we have this chief function of a child which is you know it sounds um, that could sound quite formal but I think it sounds quite grand that children have this ability to have this chief function and it is their business in the world. Again, this really speaks of Charlotte Mason's notion and principle of the born person is that they belong in the world, that they are very much apart from the very beginning and they've got a job to do. And this is their job in the first six or seven years of their life. So you imagine your children now those who, you know, the, the children who are um, from zero up to, well, seven, she says here, their primary job, their, um, their mission in education, their curriculum, as it were, is to find out all that they can about whatever comes under their notice by means of their five senses and I love that I love that we suddenly get this visual image of a whole body experience of tasting and smelling and hearing and touching and and sensing that that they have this insatiable appetite for knowledge again here we have two key things that we must believe about our children six and under one, that they belong in the world, that they are whole persons and that they have a place in the big wide world. And secondly, that they actually do have an insatiable appetite for knowledge, um, even if it doesn't look like what you expect it to look like, or they kind of look like they're wandering around aimlessly half the time, that they do have an insatiable appetite for knowledge that actually when they are placed in, in places of space and interest, 
that they are looking and touching and interested in things that catch their eye. Often the things that we say, please don't touch that or, oh no, don't go there or don't go on the edge there and we're pulling them back and we're stopping them from touching that actually they want to know. They're hungry for knowledge. They want to experience with their five senses what is going on around them. So our job, our job as parents, therefore, she goes on to say, should be to put our children in the way of making these acquaintances. Now, as you will know, and as you're probably trying to process, you know, is that there was a, a big emphasis on, on from within the Charlotte Mason philosophy to have our children outside as much as possible. I don't know how many of you have, re- have read where she talks about, um, you know, the hours and hours and hours of having them outside. And the first thing that comes to your mind is, but how do I get all the laundry done? And how do I keep the house clean? And how do I end up cooking? Well, there are, there are many ways, but I often read these things as, you know, I interpret them to apply to my context, to my context and to my family. So my question is not, how can it be? How can I get outside for four to six hours a day? My question is, how do I get outside as much as possible? You know, how do I shape the rhythms and the patterns of our life to make sure that it includes a lot of time outside? So here we have this. The endeavor of his parents should be to put him in the way of making acquaintance freely with nature and natural objects. Again, I immediately go to this is not a fake environment. This is not putting them in a, in a kind of built up park where there are things created for children this is basically taking them to the park taking them to the woods taking them somewhere that is open and free and that they can engage naturally with what is around them I love this the intellectual education of the young child should lie in free exercise of perceptive power what are they seeing what are they feeling what are they touching what are they engaging with and I as I have grown older And as I have learned more and more about childhood and just educational theory, and as I as I see other young children, it's so fascinating to watch how they engage with the world and how they exercise this perceptive power. They will find, won't they, the tiniest thing on the ground. I mean, I love going for nature walks with perceptive children because they will see things that I don't see. We were just on a walk yesterday with a whole bunch of kids. And one of the, the girls, um, one of the children we were with saw this beautiful, bright green caterpillar on the ground. And as adults, we're higher up, you know, we're looking up here. They are lower down and they're seeing different things at different levels. And she said, look, and all of us went down to see this fantastic little caterpillar that was bright green and fluffy and had a red thing on the back of it. It was incredible. But children have this perceptive power they are engaging with things and we have to give them space what is our job as the parent to put them in the way of making acquaintance freely within nature and natural objects um this extreme activity of this uh, marked by the extreme activity of this power the more we let them do this the more we will see this at work and what again what is our role as the educator to follow the lead how interesting is that again so countercultural often even in the younger years we're often um have this understanding that we are to stand at the front and show them what the world looks like where actually Charlotte Mason turns that on its head and says let them outside let them engage with beauty and interesting things and then we will follow them let's watch where they go let's watch their powers of perception at work and this is why it's really important that we don't over plan and we don't over schedule and we don't put things all the structure in place when they're four years all because this has to happen this is so key to laying the foundational bricks and laying the rhythms of a, of a charlotte mason education is allowing them to practice um this perceptive power this this um the habit of attention and observation because they're doing it already 
And then again, she reminds us of her of principle number one, children are born persons. She talks about the evolution of the complete human being, the unfolding, unraveling of this complete human being. Well, I hope you got loads out of that and we'll continue um, to dig into that. Okay, and the next one here, again, this um, perhaps, uh, uh, this is interesting. I posted this quote actually again, I think it was on last week maybe, and so many people were commenting on how relevant this is for today as much as it was back in the early 1900s. In this time of extraordinary pressure, educational and social, we could all, that could have been written today, couldn't it? This could be our existence today perhaps and I, I like that word is so important perhaps because there's a suggestion there and I think often we there are so many voices in the Charlotte Mason community and world that um almost skip over the perhaps and make it more of a should and a could and this must happen and that this is very important for for me is that there's this suggestions of perhaps this would be great perhaps this is our duty perhaps we should move in this direction this this reveals a real gentleness uh, but also a strong conviction in charlotte mason perhaps a mother's first duty to her children is to secure for them a quiet growing time a full six years of passive receptive life the waking part of it for the most part out in the fresh air again we get this emphasis on get outside be outside but this passive receptive life isn't that interesting again as this comes all the way through her writing and this really again brings up this idea of masterly in activity standing back but intentionally putting things in place for children to engage with the world around them okay i'm going to take those two away So hopefully you got lots of um, got lots out of that. But also I wanted to show you an example of how you can slowly engage with Charlotte Mason's work. So often I will do that. I will just read a paragraph that will blow me away because whatever you read, it always does. And I will take a highlighter. I will take a pen. Sometimes I will take a photocopy of it and do it all on paper or I will find it online and print it out so I can really engage with it and really draw out what does she mean? What do these words, what do these, what does it, how can I break this down? And how can I engage with this? How can I apply this to my context, my life in this 21st century culture? So here, even just from those two short passages, we get an idea of her expectation of the the parent the teacher that actually and, and the child that we are to stand back and this is a theme that you will get all the way through the charlotte mason philosophy that actually we are not to get in the way and what happens with preschool curriculums and um preschool or institutions is that there is so much that is organized and ordered and um you know, things that want needed to outcomes that have to happen. Therefore, we have to put these boxes out and, and put these things in place that even though it's kind of masked of free play and very play based, actually what we need to do is allow our children to engage with the world as much as possible. And we facilitate that we set that up for them. Um, I wrote down the phrase when I was preparing for this. I don't know if this is just a British thing or if they do this in America as well or wherever you're watching in the world. But I remember when I was at school and there was a session called show and tell. You can tell me, Christine, did you do show and tell? It's OK, that isn't America. It's not just a British thing. So you would come in and you would bring you know, your very favorite blue pen and you would stand at the front of the class and you would say, you know, this is this is my blue pen. And I love this because I write all my best words or whatever it is. Or you bring a toy in or something. And I, I thought of this phrase, that actually, we sh within the, the Charlotte Mason philosophy in this beautiful beginning stage of our life with our children, we show, but we don't tell. We show 
but we don't tell. So we can actually um, set up the stage for them. We can take them to a beautiful place. We can fill, and I will get really practical as we get to the um, next few parts of this session. And don't worry, I'm going to give you loads of tips. But we can set up our shelves and our baskets and our uh, places we visit and our plans. But what we don't want to do is the telling bit. So we can say, look. We're teaching them to look. And these powers of attention and observation and perception are really the key building blocks of the Charlotte Mason education. Can our children look? Can they see? And, and it's not just what we want them to see. You know, let, and uh, you can point stuff out and they might look at something completely different. And I know even now I will show my children a particular painting and they will see something completely different to me. And this, again, is just a reflection of our humanity, of our engaging with the world around us and how knowledge works is that it's very personal. And so to be able to endorse that in a child as they are very young is amazing. So um, hopefully you will have just maybe, you you know, some of you may do that kind of thing with the Charlotte Mason's work already. But I want to encourage you to do um, just to take some time over the next couple of weeks, maybe over the next week or even over this weekend is just pick a paragraph, maybe even use the ones that we've looked at already this evening and just pull it apart a little bit, do some study. Um, I think often we can be, we can feel the pressure to quickly work our way through Charlotte Mason's work and we must know everything. But actually that was never, when I was a young mom and when I was beginning my homeschool journey, that was, I didn't really feel that pressure because we generally didn't have social media where you feel that pressure. But I remember wanting to read and do read and do put into practice what I was reading. So I would have read a text like that. And then I would have been asking myself and my of my home and my resources, how can I put this into practice? So as much as I want to encourage you to read and engage with Charlotte Mason's work and learn, I also want it to be realistic for you to be able to put that into practice as soon as possible. There's nothing worse than, than reading a load of stuff and feeling completely overwhelmed and just feeling a separateness from, you know, a separation, like there's this barrier in the way we have to be able to apply it to our lives an hour four year old or however old uh, uh, your children are. And, and I think that's really important is that you can see um, how you can put these things into practice. So um, we have talked about preparation. We've talked about you and how you can prepare yourself for a Charlotte Mason education, how you can lay down those foundations in your life as a mum, as a teacher, as a parent. We've talked about a little bit about expectation and what Charlotte Mason, just from a couple of the passages from volume one, what she says about the child and the parent. The job of the child is to discover and explore. The job of the parent is to stand back and let that happen, to set it up and let that happen, to show and not tell. Um, and we, our, our job is to put them in the way of whatever it is, to set it up and then let them go. Um, so that could be, again, I'm going to get really practical a bit later on, but that could be where you choose to go with them, um, what you have in your home. And, and again, this is Charlotte Mason talks about atmosphere, discipline, life, and all these things come into play um, with, with the Charlotte Mason philosophy. So before I jump into the next session, the next part of our, of our time, which is realization, I just want to talk to you about really the two main things that come into this idea of a quiet growing time, quiet growing time. So um, that second passage that we looked at there, really in, in um, I'm going to grab it if I've got the right book next to me, I probably haven't. School education, I haven't got it next to me. I'll see if I've got it on here. But in school education, Charlotte Mason, I'll pop it in the email that I send out to you if I don't find the reference. Um, I think I can see it right over there. <laughs> but in, in school education, Charlotte Mason talks about the two, um, two main things, really, that 
come into this quiet growing time and they are good habits and good ideas good habits and good ideas so if you're you know if you're coming out of this workshop and trying to process what's the what are the two important things I know Leah's going to give us a list of practical things that we can do but what are the two building blocks that I can put in place after I've come off this workshop is thinking about good habits and good ideas how do we how do they uh, come into the formation of that uh, so good habits really are again perception observation um, attention and there is again when I get into the practicalities you can really see how there are things that we can do in our everyday life and rhythms that um, that, that bring that form these uh, habits of attention perception observation and there are, might be loads of habits that come to mind for you you know like picking up their clothes and brushing their teeth and saying thank you or whatever it is, um, that's for your family to decide. But for me, what was really important in those younger years um, were more than using kind of words like habits were rhythm and repetition. So I you know, children thrive on knowing what's going to happen. They thrive on, and it feels very secure when they have this knowledge of what is theirs and what's going on in their world. It's just something that it is, forms part of their belonging in a family. And for me, rhythm and repetition were really important. So um, having regular patterns of things around meal times is really great for children so maybe uh, we read a poem together at breakfast time and we go for a walk after lunch and then we read a story after dinner. very simple little things that can be hinged around when my children were very little and I was homeschooling some for in the formal years and then I had a baby and a toddler as well we would do we would finish our morning and then we would have lunch together and we'd all read together and then we'd have a rest time where everyone would have half an hour to an hour it changed as the kids got different ages and we would have this quiet time I think we call it quiet time where they would either nap or they would sit on their beds and then I if I was fought off the temptation to do the dishes or laundry, I would sit and read. And again, this rhythm, this repetition, these places, uh, this, these things that are set in place in the younger years can really help build the foundations for rhythm when it comes to the schooling years. So those kind of things are brilliant. And then Charlotte Mason talks about good ideas. So good habits and good ideas. And these ideas, again, are what form a Charlotte Mason education, connecting with ideas. And these ideas come from all the things we've just been talking about, going outside, uh, reading aloud to them, having an atmosphere of the home that is engaging and beautiful and um interesting and really involves them listening to them engaging in their conversation chatting with them around meal times rather than just catching up with your hubs at the end of the day is actually asking them questions and having them knowing what they've got to say is important so here's a really good tip for um narration so as our children get older and they're over the age of six and they're seven and you're now reading to them and asking for a narration a really good preparation for that in the younger years is to listen to them <laughs> listen to their natterings listen to their mutterings listen to their repeated story about the dog who lives three doors down whatever it is some of the times when you're kind of switch off and you go yeah 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 <laughs> And they're saying to you, you're not listening, are you? Well, I want to I want to encourage you to really for you to cultivate the habit of listening to your children and actively listening to them. So when they're telling you a story, when they're telling you something that's happened, maybe they're telling you something that has made them feel sad or, so, or they're telling you something for the 20th time, then you can get involved a little bit more. But lean in and listen and put down whatever you're doing, put down your phone, um, put, you know, turn your eyes to them and listen to them. Because if you are known as someone who listens in those younger years and listens to their stories, when you ask them to narrate and ask them to tell back, they'd be more inclined to think, oh yeah, I can do this. Mom's going to listen to me. 
So there's just a few things. People will often say to me, you know, uh, how how do you get your children to narrate? Did you have problems? What do you do if they say, I don't want to do that? And I've got, that's an, that's a whole other workshop. And I've got a lot of things, um, a lot of things I can say about that. But the fact with our family is that it's all my children ever knew. They didn't know a time when we didn't narrate and we didn't listen and we didn't, um, feedback from each other's things. So, so if you are here and you are in those early years, that's why it is a beautiful beginning. You get to listen, you get to engage, you get to lay the foundations of narration, you get to lay the foundations of attention and perception and observation by the, by the way you set up your life, but more importantly, the way you engage with your children. So um, there's just a couple of things. I think we have been going for nearly an hour. So I want to just give you a little break. We're going to have a little break and I'm actually going to stop the recording. Just going to pause it for a moment and we will be right back. Okay. So little, I think we need a little poetry break. That's what we all need. So before I go into the next two sessions, I'm actually going to share a couple of poems with you uh, for young children. So here are two poetry books that I recommend. Let me get them so you can see them. One is the Gladiola Garden. Um, and this is Effie Lee Newsom. And uh, oh, I'm sure Christine will be on that. She'll see that in a moment. And then this one is an old classic that is often recommended for young children. And this is A Child's Garden of Verse by Robert Louis Stevenson. So um, these are both lovely. I've got lots and lots of them. And I'm going to tell you where to look as well um, to get more. So let me read some poetry to you. So this is both of these poem, poetry collections have, um, they're really a, a child's perspective. So I love that. And um, this one is called, this is by Robert Louis Stevenson. And this is called A Good Play. It goes like this. We built a ship upon the stairs, all made of back the back room chairs. Sorry, I'm going to start that again. I was distracted by the chat. Okay, we built a ship upon the stairs, all made of the back bedroom stairs, and filled it full of soft pillows to go a sailing on the billows. We took a saw and several nails and water in the nursery pails. And Tom said, let us also take an apple and a slice of cake, which was enough for Tom and me to go a sailing on till tea. We sailed along for days and days and had the very best of plays. But Tom fell out and hurt his knee. So there was no one left but me. Isn't that lovely? So that's Robert Louis Stevenson. And then I'm going to read uh, one from the Gladiola Garden, which has kind of a similar feel, a little bit shorter. And this one is called The Quilt. I have the greatest fun at night when casement windows are, or oh, I'm doing the same again. I'm going to start that again. It's just like the other one. <laughs> the Quilt. I have the greatest fun at night when casement windows all are bright. I play each window is a square of some great quilt up in the air with bits of light and dark between wherever only night is seen. It really makes a mammoth quilt with blocks of black and checks of guilt that covers up the tired day in such a cosy kind of way. So there we go, little poetry break. I definitely encourage you to have poetry in the rhythm of your day. 
I love reading it on my own, uh, but I also love reading it to my children. We read poetry every day and have done since they were very little, so they hear it. Um, I also would like to correct myself from earlier on. I did have the book next to me. It's not from school education. It's from parents and children. So correction to my earlier comment. And uh, this was about the point of good habits and good thoughts. So on page 229 of parents and children, which is volume two, Charlotte Mason says the object of lessons should be in the main twofold to train a child in certain mental habits as attention, accuracy, promptness, etc., and to nourish him with ideas which may bear fruit in his life. So habits and ideas and basically that again, that is continuous throughout her work is that they are the two things that hold strong throughout the Charlotte Mason education okay so we've talked about preparation expectation um what is um how we can prepare ourselves what Charlotte Mason was uh, said about the child and the parent the expectation of her through her work and now I want to share something with you and this section is called realization and this might be like a little this is where the lights come on when there's a lights on moment and um we can actually start to see what it looks like and how we can put um these practice into it put these things into practice in these years so I'm going to share the screen again with you and this may be something that you have seen before this may be brand new to you so it's not on the first screen I'm going to just skip past that okay so please note the word formidable because that's really important to our um, I don't want to scare you for, by this list. So I'm not, when I bring this list up, I want you to remember this screen first. This is a formidable list of attainments for a child of six. And this was found in a curriculum outline from a Charlotte Mason school in the 1890s. So, you know, you'll find this sometimes banded around the internet and it and it completely scares mothers because they're like, oh, my child can't do any of that or whatever you might think. So I'm actually going to go through the list with you and just, just to show you it. And then we're going to go through again and I'm going to help you have a fresh perspective on this kind of stuff. OK, so let's just look through this list. So formidable. Remember that. <laughs> OK. To recite beautifully six easy poems and hymns. I wish I could see all your faces while I was doing this. To recite perfectly and beautifully a parable and a psalm. To add and subtract numbers up to 10 with dominoes or counters. To read what and how much will depend on what we are told of the child. So remember, this is, was for a school. To copy in print hand from a book to know the points of the compass with relation to their own home, where the sun rises and sets and the way the wind blows, to describe the boundaries of their own home. Um, I'm not sure about this one exactly. To send in certain kindergarten or other handiwork as directed. I think that's to send into the school things that they're doing at home. To tell three stories about their own pets, rabbit, dog, cat, etc. To name 20 common objects in French and say a dozen little sentences. Now, you know, if you're a bilingual family, may, they may be some a different language, but some of you will, that will be normal. To sing one hymn, one French song and one English song. To keep a caterpillar and tell the life story of a butterfly from his own observations. I feel like I skipped a page. Yeah, there's another one. To describe any lake, river, pond, island, etc., within easy reach. To tell quite accurately, however shortly, three stories from Bible history, three from early English and from early Roman history. To be able to describe three walks and three views. To mount in a scrapbook a dozen common wildflowers with leaves, one every week, to name these, describe them in their own words and say where they found them. 
to do the same with leaves and flowers of six forest trees and to know six birds by song, colour and shape. And some of you might be saying, I don't even know that. <laughs> OK, so I would love to know in the chat on first impressions, what does that make you feel like? I'm just going to come. We're going to bring this back up in a minute, but I'm just going to come off there. So just in the chat, let me know. What does that make you feel when you see a list like that? Yikes from Becky. <laughs> We're getting some emotion. Yeah. Quite excited. Good. Getting a good mixture here. Some people. How? Yeah. <laughs> I know, so I don't think on the replay you can see the chat, so I'm going to tell you a few of them. I'm actually going to open it up and have a look. Um, so we've got people saying, seems like worthy pursuits, but very intimidating, overwhelmed. Um, some, uh, yeah, intimidating, overwhelmed. I saw this list six years ago and ran away from Charlotte Mason for a while. Oh, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're back. Please don't run away. Pretty Western centric. Yes, definitely. Well-rounded nature. It's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, for a bilingual family, not so overwhelming. That's what I thought. It's so different for everybody. It seems like a lot for a child who should be spending time outside. How interesting. Really good. Really good. Okay. Keep, uh, please feel free to keep adding your comments on there. So I'm just going to quickly bring them back up again for you to see again. And then we're going to talk about them a little bit. So what we have to remember here is that, um, again, this is like this was a school. So this was uh, more of a formal setting where um, they actually you know, would have had more of a formal input into them when they were a little bit younger. And this is the ultimate. They're like, this is the best of the best. This is kind of the, the greatest outcome now. We are here gathered, I assume most of us, uh, possibly all of us, as home educators. So we didn't come to home education to, you know, to gather a list of attainments. We came because we wanted our children to engage with the world, to grow at their own stage and age and et cetera, et cetera. So when people see this, I remember seeing that and I it was later in my early years and I saw this and I thought I, I mean you know what I'm not easily scared by stuff and I generally do things my own way anyway but I did feel like oh okay that's interesting is this what a Charlotte Mason education is supposed to produce so this is how I kind of look at it and I and I uh, wanted to bring this up because you may see this this around I keep doing that on the screen okay so this is how I um, like some people in the, in the comments have said they feel excited about this. Now, I think maybe if I had read this with a two-year-old in arms, I would have kind of gone, come on, on with the challenge. But also what it can do, if you saw something like this, you would end up, you know, you would have to kind of start a mission, wouldn't you? It would be like, a, how do I attain this? How do I move towards it? And you begin to move away from that natural setting up their world, having them engage with all the beautiful things. And instead, you end up going towards attainment and tick lists. And I, I want to draw you away from that. I don't want you. My encouragement to you is to not see this as your six year old missions to accomplish. But this is how I view something like this. So I see this list as a gathering of thoughts of possible um, and worthy pursuits for young children, things that our children can engage with. A, a born person is very capable uh, and they have the, the, remember, the appetite for knowledge to be able to engage with everything on this list. I'll let you have a look through it again. So let's just look at it this way. <clears throat> if we start from the top here. So to recite beautifully six easy poems and hymns, I wouldn't see that as 
uh, six, you know, ticking off six as we do them, I would see this as an invitation. And that is the key word here. I want you, I want you to see this as an invitation, an invitation for my child to engage with poetry and hymns. So that again, might be part of your rhythm anyway, but I would encourage you to sing in your house. You know, if you sing hymns, maybe that's not part of your the practice in your family and it's not part of the faith practice but if you sing hymns or worship songs or folk songs or whatever it is that you sing them around the house have them playing you don't have to sit your child down and kind of give them a, a, a hymn hymnal <laughs> and kind of say this is what we're going to learn but children when they hear something over and over again, whether it's one verse, you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round. You've heard them sing it over and over again. But they, when they're engaging with it and it's on in the house and it's being listened to, the next thing you know, they know six songs off by heart. And you're like, whoa, how did they know that? Again, poetry. I just gave you two beautiful examples of poems that you can read. I would just read poetry at breakfast time and I would pick short ones that were rhyming, short rhyming poems. And I would say them again and again. I don't know how many of you have got children that like to hear things on repeat. Play it again, play it again, play it again. And this is how they end up picking up these things. So instead of a tick list, I want you to see this. I'm not going to have time to go into all of them, uh, but I can send you a link where you can read these yourself. But I want you to read this as an invitation to for your children to engage. So again, we've got <clears throat> parables and psalms. Re, re, just an opportunity to read them to your children from when they're very young and um, when we get I've got a big practical list to go through with you in a moment but um, this 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 add and subtract numbers up to 10 you can do that counting the stairs as they're coming up and down up and down in the morning or up and down at night or they're counting out their Cheerios or they're counting out M&Ms whatever it is you can do this is an invitation to engage with this worthy work. Um, reading, again, it's different for every child. I had some children that were brilliant readers by six and others that didn't read um, fluently until they were eight or nine. Uh, and some I know stories who are older than that. So again, I, this again has to be this personal experience and it depends on the child. Um, writing and you've got I mean things like this the compass points I remember when my children were under six I remember in my backyard I just got a big piece of chalk and I put the compass points and I wrote them I drew a big compass on the floor and um and when the sun was setting and rising I would just say oh look you know and I would put, say the words I would say which part compass point the sun was was rising in and which one was setting in again it comes out of connection conversation relationship same with things like boundaries of your own home so this is not a tick list this is not a curriculum this is an invitation again let's look again we live on a park with a river you know I know that my we didn't live here when my children were little but they would have been able to describe the river because we go there all the time and that's all it is it's quite simply again if you, there's a practice in your house of reading bible stories and this early roman history is just engaging with heroes and i can tell you where to ideas for books um three walks three views again just engaging an invitation to go somewhere regularly you might have a green space near you where you walk or you might have a, a particular place where you go at the weekend and go for a walk and and they I know they'll be able to do that because it's part of the rhythm of their life things like scrapbooking again if that's something that you do then your kids do it alongside you those kind of things come naturally this kind of stuff where they're identifying leaves and trees and birds, I really think that has to come from the mother, the parent. I think that has to be an inspired thing, whereas I am looking and pointing. And I know even now to this day, the habit, I'm sat at my desk and the kids will be in the room and I'll say, oh, look, there's a blue tip on the feeder and they're up and they see it. And that's often how my kids learned was by me just going, oh, look. <laughs> it's look at its blue head or look at its green chin or whatever it is again an invitation for connection and relationship to learn these things um i mean three stories about their pets 
gosh, my kids could tell you a million stories about their pets. Uh, that again. So again, with the, with the language stuff, that is personal to each family. But again, I mean, an invitation just to kind of, if you are not into languages yourself, is that's not something that you naturally do, that you can learn uh, 20 words yourself if you want and just say them um learn the learn the word for book learn the word for doll whatever it is and you can say them if you want to whilst you're holding them putting them up i know that christine your kids speak german right she's going to nod at me and that's because your husband grew up in germany and he's fluent so therefore and i know other families who are on here are bilingual um and 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 already we've had a comment of just the kind of it's very much a reflection of the the context the culture and the age that it was written in but i want you to see a list like this and if you're considering a charlotte mason education and what that involves i mean keeping a caterpillar again that's dead easy you can get them from um i've forgotten the company if somebody knows that you can pop it in the chat but there's a great company where you can just buy the eggs and the little pots and um yeah we've done that a few times Again, really simple. But I, when I actually started to look at this list and break it down and see it as an invitation for connection and relationship and communication and conversation rather than a curriculum or a list of attainments, there was, there was something helpful about it rather than intimidating about it. And I think that's how we have to approach these kind of lists or these kind of things that we might see abandoned around the internet is that actually they're not here to scare you. They're not here to put you off. They're here to inspire you. So, you know, we are freely home educating. You are a born person just as much as I am. And you can do whatever you like. And I love that. And I encourage you to do that. Be as creative as you like. But also we have these six volumes of books. We have these um, ideas and inspiration and things that can guide us and lead us into a wide living education for our children. So I wanted to show you that. I wanted to overcome some intimidation and I wanted to, oh, thank you. I think it's oh, somebody's talking about butterfly conservation on the, the chat there. I want you to and especially you may see also, there's another little tip here. You may see things on social media or you read blogs or you're, you're seeing people doing it a certain way. You're seeing um, somebody with like a five-year-old and a three-year-old and they've got this perfect classroom and a nature table set up or whatever. And you're actually feeling that same feeling of intimidation or I have to make it look like that. And you don't, you don't. The invitation as a, when you are a parent of young children, setting and laying the foundations for a Charlotte Mason, Mason education is to stay connected, keep their world wide and open and follow their lead. And that is really what in those first few paragraphs was so interesting, wasn't it? They have this power of perception and they have the ability to to be able to lead you into beauty and truth. Okay. So even, I mean, even the things that you read them, what they hear is really interesting. Sometimes I remember reading stories to my young children and then hearing them retell the stories to their dolls or to the dog or to the rabbit afterwards. And hear, even hearing that those natural narrations when they were very young, because they really loved the story so much. Okay, so I am now um, going to get a little bit practical and I want you to be thinking of any questions. So if you Leah, do have questions. We have two questions about oh. what you just, yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, some of these, Ashley says, some of these things we do and have then worked into our daily rhythm, others not so much. Would you recommend working towards these things with children over six? Yeah, so... Um, I'm trying to get back in my, the chat has disappeared for some reason. Hang on a second. There we go. Okay. So I, I um, am very, I'm not particularly a huge proponent of working towards certain things of attainment. Again, what I've just said is I would take them as inspiration and I would, I would take that list and pull off ideas. And some of those I'm going to list in a moment. I've got 20 practical things that you can start to do with your kids. But I would definitely take them as inspiration of things that maybe would um, 
you know, lift the bar up a little bit for you. Like, oh, actually I can, you know, I can kind of do this with them or I can do a little bit more. I think there's a tendency within the Charlotte Mason philosophy and some of you may have experienced this. You put a comment on a, on a Facebook page or something like that and you say, hey, my child is four. I want to do this with them. How would you recommend it? And everyone goes, don't do anything until they're six. And it's just not helpful at all, is it? <laughs> and you're like, but I want to do things. Life is fun. And so this is where you can look at this and get really creative. So I would not do a checklist. I would not start to kind of go, oh, I have to do this. But yes, use it as inspiration. Yes, use it as, oh, I can engage with some French language. Oh, I can... Um, actually you know we can start to do some writing and maybe some reading whereas you know often it's we're told don't do anything so I don't know if that answers your question but I wouldn't do it as a checklist I wouldn't strictly work towards it but I uh, over the chill uh, okay so so Ashley who asked that question there is another list um I don't want to scare anybody else but there is another list for children up to the age of 12 so I will um in fact Christine you might be able to find that so if you go on the Ambleside online website the page that has the attainments for six-year-olds also I think underneath it has the attainments for 12 so Ashley if you are interested in that if you if that kind of excites you and drives you and you feel your children will respond to that creatively then have a look at the next list and see if you want to work towards that but you know what and no pressure for anybody I think um Am I looking at the next question? Oh, thank you, Christine. With reading, would Charlotte encourage phonics before six? Presumably it would depend on each child and their interest. This surprised me. It had to be written on the list. Yeah, it surprised me as well, actually, um, Alice. So what I would suggest, what my understanding of this is that their formal teaching of reading doesn't, you know, wouldn't have been... Um, so much in those early years but that actually one of my tips I'm going to give you in a minute is that when you do some of your reading aloud is that your child is next to you and looking at the book with you so they're not just hearing the words but they're watching the words on the page so one of my children kind of learned to read that way just by um just by looking at what I was reading and seeing how the words and decoded them and put them together. But there are, there, there are, um, p &E programs and there's evidence we from through the archives that charlotte mason schools especially after world war ii they started nurseries and preschools and they would do um reading lessons i don't specifically know of phonics somebody else might know might be more researched in that area um but um I'm sure I started doing some, for those who are in England, you'll know what jolly phonics are. I don't know if that's American as well, but um, I remember, I've, in fact, we were watching some videos the other day. My kids brought them up of Micah being really little and copying one of the older children, but doing like ah, 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 and kind of doing all these phonics and sounds and things. And he, he was the, I think out of all four, he was the quickest to read just from mimicking everybody else and watching everybody else. So I don't know if that answers your question, Alice, but I would just have them engage with books and, um, you know, words and see if they're, I think generally, if they're generally the advice is if they are interested and they are wanting to, then you can start to introduce more of, um, yeah, more of a kind of pattern to what you're doing with them. Um, Butterfly conservation are very much against insect law. Oh, Amanda, that's helpful and interesting. Okay, thank you. So we should just watch them then. That is interesting. That's helpful as well. Um, any other questions I've missed, Christine? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so please put any more questions in. I realize we're, we're getting to the kind of the last section now. But if you've got anything else specific, I am going to start to go through some. Um, oh, thank you, Alice. Some really practical things now. And I've got a long, 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 long list. So before I go into the practical um, 
ideas of things that you could be doing with your children under six years old. I want to tell you about something that some of you may know about this already, um, but I'll be looking at it, looking at it again recently. I never used it, but I know some people did. So if you are, I am more and more not wanting though mums who are writing on forums with children under six to be shot down by you know older Charlotte Mason mums who are saying don't do anything because I don't believe that at all <laughs> I think if you are loving and nurturing and enthusiastic and you want to engage your children with the world around you then go for it also the other thing to say here is if you are a mother of many children and you're on here because you have got a few who are that age, then you will know how much they watch the older kids, how much often they want to get up at the table and do some work or they want to narrate with the rest of them. And I, you know, don't shut them down. Don't stop them. The, the general um, teaching from Charlotte Mason is that, um, we don't require a narration from a child under six years old. But so many of my young children were just, they wanted to tell me about what they saw in the picture or what they heard in the book, um, even when they were, you know, four years old. And I would just say, yes, of course you can. Why, you know, why would you, you don't ever stop that. So it's the same with anything, really. If you see your child being interested and developing and kind of growing in a certain way and hungry to learn and to, to get uh, and to connect with knowledge, then go with it. Just go with it um, and let let them do that. Um, so what I wanted to tell you was Ambleside Online, which I haven't got personal experience this, but I have looked at it and it's very good. They do a year zero a year zero. So Christine will put it in the chat just so you can have a look. So if you are the kind of person that would like to have, you're, you're kind of getting ready and you would like to have, maybe it's your first child you're home educating and you really are, you know, you want to have some kind of plan, something to go, go by. Have a look at this because um, it's really lovely. And they basically say what I've been saying tonight. There's no different advice of, you know, but it is very much like, hey, Charlotte Mason, her general advice is for, start formal education from six. But this, these are the things that she recommended. And on there, there are lists of beautiful books, poetry, books that we can read um, about heroes and fables and stories and lots and lots of advice about going outside. So have a look at that. And even if you don't want to follow it, you might want to get inspiration from it. So have a look at that year zero Ambleside online. And I guess that in many uh, pre-K, um, some people call it or, you know, but it could be even younger. So have a look at that. Brilliant for, um, for book um, recommendations and I'm reading I'm reading um, just a little bit of the the chat but I'll let you you guys catch up on that about reading um, so Amanda was saying um, I feel bad following my child's lead when she's interested to learn yeah Amanda um, let her learn I think it's sad isn't it that often we because of what we've heard or what we've seen um from other people we think we need to short you know cut short our child's um curiosity and i think that's that's crazy isn't it really when you think about it we need to keep the world wide open for them and let them learn let them ask all the questions and do all the things okay so before we get any more questions i have got and i'm going to zip through them and you'll be able to watch them again on the replay i have 20 steps not 20 steps 20 practical formative steps to build a foundation of a charlotte mason education so these are things you can do things you can um you know kind of uh, get put into practice with your children and i've got 20 i could probably have written 60 but i've written 20 and you guys can add to the list i am going to send this list to you 
uh, with the replay. So you don't have to, you can write them all down if you want. I can see some of you putting your pens down and relaxing, um, but you can write them down. Okay, so here are 20 things. I'm going to whiz through them and then I'm going to take your questions if there are any more. So number one, create rhythms and regularity of patterns in your life. I mentioned this already. Read a book at night, a poem over breakfast, walk after lunch. So many of you will do this already. It's very common, isn't it, to say your prayers and read a story before you go to sleep. But think about regularity and rhythm. How can you start to put things in place that will lay a foundation for formal learning? And this is really, really helpful. This was so helpful for me. Um, I remember doing things in a regular way. And then we just extended that once they hit six, that we naturally around the table in the morning started to add other things to it. So there wasn't this big shift of welcome to the beginning of school. I've never really been like that. Um, I'm not not dissing the kind of blackboard saying, you know, first day of grade one or whatever you do, you you do you. But I've always wanted to keep it as natural as possible. And as kind of this is this is life. So we would go from those rhythms of things always um, happening in the morning and then extending those into formal learning, but they were already in place. So look for opportunity to create rhythm and regularity. You might have a family that cannot do that. Husband works shifts, you work as well, and there's all sorts, but find a moment in the day or two moments where you can have a regular pattern of something, of being together and having intentionality about that. Number two, have books around the house. Make it normalize seeing them everywhere. So um, if you are a neat freak, you might need to just let go of that a little bit and have them on bookshelves nice and neat. Yes, that's great but they're less likely to grab them off the shelf if they're all just like neatly put away. So I would always have baskets by the fireplace with books in that children could grab. I would have like, you know, little tubs in my room when they'd come in in the morning, there was always a basket or a tub of books that they could grab, have them where they know they can hold them. They can um, open them. They can be, they can get them sticky. Um, and those wipeable books are fantastic, aren't they, when they're very young. But just make books and them having a connection with books rather than it just being all neatly on shelves that mum and dad just grab them and it's their special thing. Or give them their own shelf that they can, you know, if you want it nice and neat and tidy. This is your shelf. These are your two shelves. Let's put your books up there. But have, uh, create um, a normal uh, normality around books around the house that everyone can pick up. Number three, play different kinds of music all the time in the house. So um, have, I mean, I used to have classical music in the morning when they were coming downstairs. Um, so, or I would have classic MN, classic FM on in the kitchen. But I um, honestly play loads of different kinds of music. Make sure you're playing music that reflects your culture and other cultures around you. Play music of all different genres and variety so your children can hear not just one kind of music. Often we do, we can, even the Charlotte Mason um, philosophy, we can do folk music and classical music, which is very much what she taught for, for purpose. But I think music is really key to create an atmosphere, but also children. In, and, and what I like to do, I like to watch them, uh, like to watch their reaction or watch them. You watch your kids move, put some jazz music on, see how they react to it. It's great fun. Um, whatever it is, you know, just play different kinds of music and have that again as being quite normal. Um, I grew up in a house with loads of music. Honestly, we heard everything from Gregorian chants to Hillsong worship music. I mean, and everything in between. My mom would play jazz music. My dad would play classical music. Then we'd have, um, I remember my dad playing Madonna and Tina Turner. <laughs> <laughs> which was weird for my dad, but um, they intentionally, but also because they were interested. My husband grew up in a home that did not play music. 
he just doesn't remember is she going to say hip hop somebody's saying absolutely play whatever you want <laughs> um you be you that is important but my husband growing up in a home where he just didn't hear music and he didn't understand different didn't hear different genres and that was something that he learned to appreciate in later life but still just doesn't get some some genres of music so expose them to loads of different music okay number four i'm gonna have to speed up have art prints or postcards around the house that they can see you don't have to study them you don't have to know uh who they are i'm just trying to grab one right next to me here um if you go to an art gallery you can generally pick up postcards you can get them like three for a couple of pound a couple of dollars um of of prints that are in the gallery and just grab some postcards like this or buy a cheap um calendar uh, an art calendar and cut them up and just have them it might not go with your decor doesn't matter just pop them up in different places i sometimes have them on the back on the side of bookcases just on the side but have them in view again i grew up in a house where my mum would put my mum wasn't an artist she i did was not home educated and she was not um she didn't go to university you know i wasn't the kind of academic household but she just would stick up art prints around the house and I remember in our bathroom this Renoir being up at the back of the door and just you know this this was normal I saw art around me and my even my parents childhood that was normal for them and somehow we've taken that out we over decorate and we make everything pristine and clean but actually kids uh, young children imagine them walking around the house and seeing Mon Monet and Degas and seeing these wonderful things and then you get to take them to a gallery and they see them for real anyway I'm very passionate about that kind of stuff so have art around your art, grandma's art, and famous art. Get it around the house. Okay, um, number five, this is a given. Get outside as much as possible. Um, wander. Don't, don't go to kind of, well, tr as little as possible, go to these kind of kids' places, kids' adventure places. They're really fun. But if you want your children to engage with the world around them, then go to a big park or some woods. And I hang on a second I have got something to show you I have a tray here so one of the things that I wrote down was let them pick up stuff let them get messy let them put things in their hands as long as it's safe nothing poisonous um so at the moment uh we've got these conkers everywhere on the ground and I have this I have many things. I don't think you can quite see. I'll show you if I do that. Can you see up there? That's a small collection of things that my children have found and brought home and I have. But on this tray here, um, this is a few things that I've just pulled off. Examples of what children will grab and hold, you know, pack, they'll put them in your pockets and put them in your handbag, like conkers and um, pine cones. Uh, I mean, if you live near the sea, We've got backs of crabs and these might gross some people out. Look, I've got lobster claws. <laughs> Anybody getting grossed out? Beautiful shells. I mean, children just love to hold them. A, a, an egg that had fallen down and, and be an eggshell, sorry, that had be fallen down in our garden. I mean, so many of you, I'm sure you will have trays and pots of these and you're like, how often how many do you keep before you go to start getting rid of stuff or if it starts to smell but this is just it's treasure see it as treasure so when they're out and about you when they bring you something it, it can be so tempting to be like okay lovely you know it's another dead flower or something or a, a berry but actually help them to engage with nature by seeing what they're bringing as treasure. And I personally do see it as treasure. Um, so get outside, get into wide open spaces, go to woods, go to parks, go to places where they can collect their treasures. And um, uh, somebody's saying they've got a garage full of rocks and I love to see what you've got. 
rocks and sticks yep so yeah rocks and sticks I think in another part of this room I've got a lot of rocks and sticks when we moved house I had to um I had to get rid of a lot so somebody's asking how uh, what do you do with those trays next so this particular tray I don't have lots of them but I put them on windowsills so I do have a room this this room here um where I can put stuff and um the the little drawers that I showed you up there they have they're full of rocks and shells and all sorts but if I want the children to engage with them and see them um and mine are a lot older I think I got these out for my nieces um but if I want them to engage with them and see them and just have a look at them or draw some of them, I mean, that's a, a whole other evening, you know, put them in the, in the middle of a table. That's why I put them on trays like this, but they will often be on a windowsill or this was, is, has just been on my bookshelf for a while. So that answers that question. Okay. Um, number six, we've got quite a few to get through here. Um, have pencils, colors, crayons, paper thing pots of things like this um have them out it's so easy isn't it to put them in drawers and put them in cupboards and have everything tidied away and to get them out on tuesday afternoon when you do drawing no have somewhere where they're just out I'm, i know i'm really endorsing a messy house here but you can tidy up at the end of the day but have them out have them grabbable have them um in places where they can you know on that list we saw can they can they copy a word out how are they ever going to practice copying a word out if you can't see the mark making and hopefully on the paper and not on the table but have those things out and grabbable and ready pencil colors um paper all those things um number seven read 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 with them read to them read with them on your lap so they can see the words and read stories of heroes good living books um uh, they basically are books that tell a story. There's a passionate author and they lead you into something wonderful. And just, you know, have it, read to them. It's not like a constant spend all day reading because I like someone's already said, if you're going to be outside all the time, how have you got time for all that? But like we said at the beginning, create rhythm and regularity around patterns of just reading and having the children engage with books themselves. Um, number eight, again, this is related to what we've just looked at that list. You can have foreign words, um, have foreign foreign words language stuck on familiar objects or say words learn a few yourself even if it's just a couple of words of familiar things um like a, a mug or a, a plate or a, or a book just just start to kind of create that where there is another language and mom and dad know a few of these words and we're going to say them hearing them is really important when they first start that journey into foreign language um number nine uh singing singing you know this your mamas you know about singing singing is so brilliant even from the womb my children heard singing um learn nursery rhymes hymns songs that are important to your culture and your context learn the songs sing them doesn't you don't have to have a good voice you don't have to have this beautiful angelic voice they will just love it I remember my um when I was pregnant with my fourth child Sienna my youngest daughter my eldest daughter would sing um Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so she would sing it in the womb to her she just naturally would just come and snuggle up and sing it to her and then when she was first born um she would sing it to her again it was just this really beautiful connection through song uh, which we, they talk to each other about about this song that they both know and they both remembered so that can be something you do as well but nursery rhymes are brilliant um hymns songs anything just sing 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 it's so good for them number 10 i've already mentioned this listen to their stories listen to them chattering and chuntering and if there's a really good one write it down have a note on your phone have a notebook jot down their stories they're so cool to be to tell them back when you were three you said this when you were you know when you were first talking you said this you once told me about this story so keep a record of the stories 
Um, number 11, again, this idea from that list, this idea of keeping a scrapbook of their nature discoveries or your trips out, just have a really big old scrapbook, the real traditional ones with the really thick paper. And if you go on a trip, you know, get a leaflet, stick it in. If they find a leaf, stick it in, but just don't be too precious about it. It doesn't need washi tape and posh writing. Just stick stuff in and let it belong to them and express them. I know you're all out there going, but I want to have calligraphy on it. I want to make it all neat and tidy. They will tear it and it will get spilt on. So why not start off with it like that way? Just rough and ready, but full of their treasures and full of wonderful things. Again, a really great way of beginning like this idea of notebooking and of, of keeping something together in one place is a brilliant practice for laying the foundation for a Charlotte Mason education. Number 12, have a familiar walk to observe changes but also adventure to new places for variety. So when my children were young, we didn't live in this house. We had a lot smaller house. There was a green space with a few trees and uh, near where we lived. And we would go there, you know, four times a week, possibly sometimes more. And we went there regularly because we could get there easily. But then we noticed the seasonal changes because we went somewhere regularly. But also at the weekend, we would drive somewhere to the woods, to a different park, to observe differences. So have a familiar walk so that children can see the changes in, in the trees, in the environment, in the whatever, the sky, uh, but also adventure out and do different things. Um, number 14, learn about your garden, your house, your boundaries, your local green area, like I've just said. Charlotte Mason says the first nature study starts in your garden. You know, let get them doing whatever bit of gardening you do, whether you are a great gardener or you I don't know you're not into it and you just tidy it up a couple of times a year get them out there with you you know find a patch a patch that they can work in or get them um, familiar with the trees in your garden and the plants you can identify themselves so that you're familiar with what's in the garden it took me years when we moved here to discover all that was growing and then introduce my children when you introduce your children to things in your garden you're introducing them to new friends I think that is a great great concept so number 14 learn about the garden number five have uh, sorry 15 where am I I'm going backwards number 15 have those conversations about the sun rising and the sun setting like I said earlier put those compass points write them on the yard on the floor at the back of your house so that they're familiar we made up a game where you had to jump from north south east west there were so many things like that that they just got familiar with um but you use those conversations when the sun is setting say hey come and come and have a look at this you know which compass point are we on number 16 um foundations of a charlotte mason education for maths or math um have manipulatives on hand have things that they can touch and hold again you can use the things you're collecting you can use conkers or acorns or shells if you want or anything you know buttons or or small bricks um those of you who live in in, in the uk um i posted two weeks ago I think about Lidl which is a bit like Aldi and they'd got all these cool um uh wooden maths math sets um for a couple of pound you know grab stuff like this like wooden shapes that you can just have on the table just like you would have crayons and paper and have them available so they get so that, you know they might just sit and play with this triangle and they're learning this shape just from holding it and they might draw around it but you're having things to be able to count um i was sat with i went to some uh, friend's house for dinner during um uh, over the summer and their little girl who must be four she was collecting some stones or something in the garden she brought them all to me and we were I was right in there and we had them all on the table and she just slowly was counting them naturally I didn't even start that off with her and we were doing this counting game together because she had something in her hand that she could do with again it's it's setting up the world for them to be able to engage with these things so 
a beginnings of, a, of, of understanding maths concepts. It's all about handling things, counting things, making steps, doing all that kind of stuff. Brilliant foundations. Um, number 17, simple handcrafts projects. Brilliant for hands-on stuff with children. Whatever you're into, some of you may be super crafty and you and kids are um, doing cross-stitch and French knitting. and But, you know, paper folding, any kind of thing where they are uh, mastering something or or create like we did cross stitch stuff I'm not brilliant at all that kind of thing so I would make things as simple as possible but I would try I always tried um but I remember doing uh, getting the cross stitch which have really big chunky cross stitch projects and um all of us enjoying that kind of thing so you know get some hands-on projects and um you could sit one afternoon and, and try those um Couple more. Number 18, let them cook or bake with you. Get an apron, get them an apron, let them get involved with weighing and measuring and kneading and mixing. I know it's easier when they're not in the kitchen, especially when you're doing the cooking and there's a lot of cleaning up to do. But I feel like I'm really endorsing mess tonight. Maybe I am, <laughs> but let them get their hands in there and uh, watching the scales go up and down. Um, I've got digital scales, but then I went to a second hand shop when my kids were younger and I bought some proper scales that they could see moving from putting weights on them and, and trying all that different stuff out, but getting them involved with, with measuring, seeing, uh, you know, measuring liquids and, and all that kind of stuff is just so amazing and so formative and so part of laying those foundations for, for grasping knowledge, even looking at recipes with you and figuring out amounts for each person. Um, I think it's brilliant. Another thing that I love to introduce my children to within this is hospitality. Again, cooking for other people. When people are coming over and I'm making a mass lasagna or a huge chili, that they are involved with that and they know because we're, we are feeding more people, we are extending our table. This is how much we have to do. And that, again, that's another conversation, but great for character development. Um, 19 and 20. Number 19, uh, this is something that I used to do when I had younger children, but I was teaching older children. I would have what I called revolving baskets. So they didn't actually revolve. I revolve them. I switch them up. So I would have baskets or tubs of um, hands-on things I want to they're not really activities that's a I don't know if I use that word right but basically one basket would have lots of different textured materials in it and then yarn and then another one would have natural objects you know lots of things like this another one would have um colored bricks in and and I would basically when I was doing work with the older children I would if they, they if they weren't sat on my knee or whatever they were going they would have a turn at one or two of these baskets and I would rotate them uh, over a few days. So it always felt like something new. But again, these beautiful, different textured hands-on activities um, that are just brilliant for the brain. And number 20, I um, was throwing this in here. Surprise them. Show them the moon in their pajamas at night. Go camping. Go for a late night bat walk or an owl listening session or something like that. But again, this, this amazing way of saying you belong in the world with me. You are worthy of doing this. But also that connection and conversation and relationship is is really amazing so i have whizzed through those but those are just 20 of tons i'm sure that you could add so many more of really practical ideas that actually are really fun and engaging and things that we can do with our children that will be a formative and help build a foundation of a Charlotte Mason education. Okay, I am going to jump into the chat. We have nearly been two hours now. So um, I'm just having a look, um, Christine, but if there's something I've missed, please let me know. I'm going straight to the bottom. I can see um, Larissa. So there's not much to worry about with kids under two, right? I always feel like I'm not doing enough. She has plenty of free time that she's just running around the house, picking up random objects and playing with them. I think that sounds 
fine, Larissa, completely fine. I think that we often get concerned when we've got other children who are older and we're busy with them and we feel, you know, those feelings of like, oh, I'm not doing enough with them. But if you're not, if you're seeing them engaged and happy and just, you know, they are listening and engaging with life around them, then I think that's fine. I don't think we need to get ourselves so stressed out. I think life happens for our little ones so beautifully and so naturally. Can you recommend any living books for under sixes? Um, Becky, I'm going to send out some lists for you. It's difficult to do that on a workshop um, like this because there's so many there's absolutely tons um so i will send you out some with the replay i'm going to send out some places where you can get good lists for that and there there's places all over the uh, the internet but look for um um charlotte mason wasn't massively into picture books um which is interesting but I, i like i love um good illustrations i think i think they're great um so i will make sure you get places to look for 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 books like that um julie's saying we made nature boxes out of cardboard and hot glue gun different compartments different sizes to display their treasures that's wonderful the little box i've got up there is is an old it's from ikea but it is wonderful to to go um Amanda, I find it difficult to find lists for books. There's so many to choose from. Yeah, I, you know, I've never really, I think I would often um, look for, um, I would look on lists for inspiration, but then I would just look for myself. And and I am going to tell you about my next workshop in a moment, but that will help you do this, is that learning to discern what a living education is and what living books are. You get to just choose your own and you don't need the lists anymore. So you go to bookshops, you go to secondhand shops, you, you know, you, you kind of go to your friend's shelves and you find those wonderful living books. So, you know, all the stuff like A.A. A. Milne, all the Winnie the Pooh stuff, um there's just there's just so many and they're all really wonderful i'm i'm slowly looking at my shelves i'm so tempted to start pulling books out but it is 10 o'clock guys <laughs> so um i really must stop um so emma my four and a half year old has no interest in learning to read he loves to read but would rather spend his day playing in the garden is it okay to wait until six to even introduce the idea of reading. Emma, I think if you're, um, you know, if if they'd rather be spending their time outside in the garden, I mean, I, I really wouldn't want to put, a, you know, you wouldn't want to stunt that or stop that. I think I would just continue to read to them and have books be part of their life and um and when when you know they start to show more of an interest then be led by them and I am really I have had four children all learn to read at different stages some much easier than others one really really struggled and concerned everybody apart from me and we got there in the end um so so I really yeah I think that um, I think that it's it's fine. Lola for Mickey, I introduced the alphabet two weeks before my younger one turned five. That's really interesting. And I bet, but I bet they were seeing words in books and, and seeing that reading. Um, Olga, can you comment on socialization socializing? If we go to natural spots with our boys, I feel anxious sometimes that they miss on communication with other children on the playgrounds. Um, I think you can do both, Olga. I think that that whole idea of finding community and finding people that you can connect with and then the children can, you know, play with other children. It's so individual to each family and each child on how they um, engage with the people. But we start, I started a nature group where we would go to on nature walks with other families. I don't know if you can do something like that. So four or five families with children, a similar age, and we would all go for, um, to a, to a, you know, a more of a nature spot and adventure together. And, and we still do things like that today. And that's where we found the caterpillar, uh, yesterday, which was amazing. So, so maybe you could try something like that. Christine, have I missed any questions? Uh, no, there was one very specific thing on, did you always eat breakfast together? Or did you oh. have kids? Or did you have kids eating at different times? I think trying to figure out rhythms today is 
yes kind of a thing good question uh personally we did yes we always did eat breakfast together when my children were young um not not it looks different now because uh children well i've got two who are working and out of the house all the time and um two who are well one teen and one almost coming up for that kind of preteen age so they wake up at different times so i have a nowadays how our life looks is that we have a i have a set time when i want to get going and start and um i get breakfast stuff out and so we do our more kind of morning time thing not around food anymore um for the first time in like 15 years or something crazy <laughs> because i've gone with the age and stage of my children and we adapt when they change so yeah but when they were when they were this age always we would always eat breakfast together they may have had a pre-breakfast i mean you know what kids are like they're like hobbits aren't they so they may have had a little snack when they woke up <laughs> or two uh, but we would have some kind of, yeah, sit down together around the table and food helps them sit still for a little bit, doesn't it? For some kids anyway. <laughs> okay, well, this has been, oh, has anyone started orienting? Okay, I'll, I'll let, um, I know we could keep chatting and here in the UK, it is 10 o'clock and Christy and I are uh, fading fast. <laughs> But it has been really wonderful to gather us all here tonight. I just want to quickly share with you before I um, before it goes live anywhere else, because this is not not this. We've seen enough of this, haven't we? <laughs> Hang on a sec. I'll get to it. Oops. Okay, here we go. So just to let you know, the next workshop, if you are interested, is on the 6th of um, November. It's called A Living Education, and I will be going into detail of what a living education is, how to discern what a living book is, and what Charlotte Mason meant by living books and things. Um, so this is a great next stage, really. And some of you, if you've got children who are slightly older, this might be helpful. Um, this will not be going live until Monday as in I won't be telling anybody else until Monday um, there are obviously limited slots so I'm telling you and the people who are getting the replay video you will get to know about it first so if you do want to book in um, I think Christine is putting the link into the slot just like all the other ones pay whatever you can just want to make sure we get these accessible for people and a replay will be available so if you do want to book into that get in this weekend if you want because it'll go live on monday on everything else and that's when it tends to fill up pretty quickly so thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everyone watching on the replay i hope this has been helpful i hope you've got some creative ideas to lay a foundation for a charlotte mason education most of you will know where i am please come on over and say hi on instagram or sometimes I hang out on Facebook but generally Instagram or you can email me if you've got any further questions but really enjoy these beginnings of your time with your children because it is glorious it is really beautiful and um, I I loved it I loved that time and it's been great talking about it again tonight okay well I'm going to say goodbye and um, have an amazing weekend everybody